And we're back with the Hammer Podcast. That's right, Hammerheads. It's Hammer Time. We are back in the saddle here at the golden microphones of the excellence in pastoral broadcasting just to give the Arminians a fighting chance. That's right. We we're diving back into the Christian and political engagement. We talked a little bit about a grid and just, you know, before we get started, I think it's helpful to note that all politics in the end is local. It's at the local level. So if you're going to engage the culture, are you engaging locally? And one of the best ways to do that is the precinct strategy. So if you're interested, look that up, the precinct strategy. Um, but, you know, here as we get going, we wanted to just reiterate the the pre-mill, that post-mill, and ah-mill, and how, you know, there seems to be just like an extraordinary tension between those three camps and their opinions about political engagement. Yeah, and, and, and what I, know you what I to, don't right, I don't want it to get lost in everything we've been talking about because we went through each of these systems uh, in a fairly thorough manner. Yeah, I think it was pretty thorough. Uh, more thorough than the treatment you're going to get in most places, unless you're going to go to a seminary classroom. Even then, we got more. I you think know, we thorough did. than a lot of those classrooms. And we brought it down for the regular person to understand because half our theological brains was are tied, tied behind, behind our backs. backs. Yes, in honor of Rush. That's right. Well, yeah, so my point, the point about this whole series, right, is that we're in the public square, right. whether we're pre, post, ah, or even the pan millennialist, all <laughs> these, the, right? They're we, the most we, spiritual, we should, the That's pan right. We should still, we should still all uh, be active Engaging the culture for Christ, uh, and and really, th- there shouldn't really be a difference. No, based on what we think. But well, I wanted to bring this up again because one of the things we've been mentioning is that there are a lot, uh, uh, several at least that we know. Yes. And so if we extrapolate that out, I'm going to say a lot. Oh yeah, yeah. And talking to some other pastors, I think they're saying the same thing, right? Where there are a lot of younger believers who don't like the weakness and the wokeness. Yeah, the weakness a, and the wokeness, in, that's in right. In a lot of circles. Uh, and so they're gravitating towards post-millennialism because they see the Doug Wilsons of the world and they say, well, and they're equating post-millennialism with not being weak and actually being able to engage the culture right. uh, politically. Right. As if pre-mill or on-mill... Or beta males. Somehow can't do that right. Yeah. Uh, And just a perfect example of that was we saw one young man that, uh, you know, I know you've poured a lot of time into, and uh, we we love him greatly. Yeah, He hasn't been gone from the church for too long, but but saw him recently. You know, he'd moved back away after graduation, and and he comes back and tells us, you know, he's he's Mm post-millennial. You know, (laughs) now he doesn't really, he couldn't articulate a whole lot about it except that... uh, you know, in his mind, right? That's the view that allows you to be engaged. politically engaged, right? And to be able to say, "Hey, something's wrong with our current government and all that," right? Right. And what I'm saying is that's just not the truth uh, of the matter. And and I mentioned many premillennialists before, uh, including Francis Schaeffer. You know, he was a historical premillennialist. He was not a, a dispensational premillennialist like a, a Jerry Falwell. And uh, most of the folks involved in the moral majority, but but the point is that I, I can give you, I can list post mill, on mill, pre mill guys that have all engaged in their time, right, uh, in the culture and and in the political sphere. Now they haven't all done it the way that we thought they should, and we talked about that a few weeks ago, right? But the point is just simply that it's it's a fallacy to say that well, if I'm pre mill. Or I'm mill, I can't engage in right. the culture. I, I have to be post mill. Now, it's 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 just not true. Yeah. And that's kind of what I wanted to say is that we should all uh, agree, uh, for the most part, in our engagement in the culture. Now, there's always going to be a little bit of difference of opinion with this or that. Sure. You know? Okay. Yeah. Like how how do you engage? Right. And that's one of the things right. we're talking about now. Is like what are What's a grid for our engagement? How do we do that? How do we lean into it? Right. I mean, you might have a theonomist again 
you know, pushing for some things that we wouldn't push for. Right. Okay. Um, so, but but I think, and, and I think a big part of this, and we'll probably talk about this later, is as Christian, as a Christian, I don't, we're not to change the culture. A lot of times we talk about that. I've probably even said that. But, you know, as I read Scripture and I think, I, I don't, I think we're, we're to create culture, mm-hmm. not change. God's already told us, you know, how to live. Right. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're to create culture. Not, yeah. not We're not really trying to, you know, change it. No, I think that's good. But, and it starts, it, it all, that's what I was saying at the beginning, all politics is local. And sure. it, at its yeah. localist level is the family, right? Sure. yeah. So our families create a culture of truth. And then we go out into the spheres around us and create a culture of truth. Because what does Jesus say? Don't hide your light under a bushel. Yeah, that's right. Right? So I'm taking the light, truth, into the darkness. And then as we take it out into yeah. our, the, our our spheres of influence, that puts us in our county, which puts us in our state. Right? All these things are connected. But it requires us having enough courage to take truth right. into darkness. Yeah, and of course that's part of how we got where we where we are in our own nation. Because even in, even in more conservative places, all of a sudden you look and the school board's liberal, and you're yep. like, "How did this happen?" Yeah. And that's where you're talking about local politics. A lot of people have been woken up to that, which is uh, which is good. Um, so anyway, so I wanted to make sure I mentioned that again and and get that out of the way because when our friend visited us. You know, we were able to look at each other and say, yep, that this is, he's the poster child for exactly what we've been talking about. Yeah. Because there are a lot of these, you know, uh, brothers and sisters out there, and uh, they just need to know that you, you, you don't have to hold to one particular eschatology, you know, to be, uh, to be engaged in the culture. Uh, we all should be. Right. We so, all should not hide our light under a bushel. Right, right. Which exactly. also brings up the question of, you know, influence or truth. Like, because you, you all the, there's a couple of the guys that would maybe be in the ah mill type camp. Yeah. Or at least, you know, maybe a historical pre mill. Yeah. That, you know, they engage the culture in a way that we would look at and say, wow, this is not what I would do. Yeah. You know, so is it, what is the purpose of the engagement? Is it influence or is it truth? But we could, you know, we got no, lots no, no, to that, say, that's a great, and I think it's an interesting question, but maybe for another time. Yeah, yeah, and I think the influence versus truth goes right along with the the create versus change culture, right, and all of that. And we, but we do need to touch on that because I want you to flesh that out more because that is so true, and I think it will help uh, our hammerheads understand why some Christian leaders uh, go in one direction while others take a different tack. Right. All kind of saying similar words, like, okay, we want to take truth into the culture, but acting differently. But I think, you know, you had mentioned the Peter passage, and I think to stay in the rhythm of where we're at, because, you know, we got Romans 13, made a great case for the two Neros, uh, both bad, one, you know, psychopath, transgender type. Um, yeah. and, and how sometimes the Peter passage has been misunderstood and really used as a cudgel on Christians to, you know, become docile. Yeah. Yeah, so that's right. Let's, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and going back, you know, a few years years ago, you know, with, uh, with, with COVID, one of the things that COVID did do was expose uh, a, a lack of biblical understanding amongst those who claim to be Christians. I mean, we always knew that it was out there, right? We, yeah. we, we've always had people claiming to be Christian who seem to know little or no scripture. The part for me, I never knew you line, you, as we like to say. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of people that just clearly aren't saved. Um, but even amongst some who, who might be saved, they're just not, you know, they've gotten, you know, emotion has replaced exegesis in our culture. And so... Well, emotion... Draws a big crowd. Yeah, right. Um, so when you look at it, it really exposed a lot and and told us a lot about kind of where the church overall... As terrible as it in, was, in, it was 
very providential. It was right. It, it, was. Was, it shed a you lot know. of light on things. Yeah, that needed and even light. Uh, our good friend, you know, John MacArthur said, you know, talked about that. That you know, it, it really helped. It was a clarifying moment, right? Uh, helping weed out, you know, a lot of the shafts. So, uh, so from that standpoint, you know, it, it was good and and positive from that standpoint, right? But yeah. but when we went through that time it was interesting to see because you had some people who I think are true believers who uh, they had never really had to think about some of these issues because you know you're not a believer living in China with an underground church mm-hmm. so they've never really it, it's we're comfortable enough yeah the government leaves us enough we, we have leaves us alone <laughs> we have so many freedoms you can put we, a fish on the back of your car right. your business and get get right. work yeah right. here. I don't know if that would work in L.A. Well, it might not work uh, in L.A. They probably wouldn't have a clue what it was, honestly. In, in they Lynchburg. Just think you're, they yeah. probably would think you're a fisherman, in which case they wouldn't like you because you're probably somehow ruining the environment. Mother uh, Earth nothing else, demands you're, you're sacrifice. You're a fish, and that hurts. Yes. That fish has feelings. Yeah, fish anyway, are friends. Um, back on track, we... Uh, <laughs> but one of the things we saw was people wrestling with this, right? And and in regards to the to the Peter passage... I will never forget Todd Friel, who, I you know, I've always only been able to listen to him for so long. Ratchet because Radio. He's so sarcastic. Um, and I'm not quite sure that that's a, a call to ministry, what he does. But anyway. A call to sarcasm? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the Babylon Bee's not, funny, but I don't think that's a ministry either. Yeah, no. But, you know, and I'm not against those things per se. But anyway, Todd came out and... I was shocked. He, he used the example, if I remember correctly, of an a, of a pinwheel. Yeah, like wearing a pinwheel with doilies yeah, he, he, or doilies yeah, or something. Yeah, he said if the government, he was talking about the Christian submission of the government. Do you think can Snerdly pull the clip? Uh, I don't know. We'll let him work on it. We'll let yeah, Snerdly see if he can pull the be, clip. But, you know, he said if the government tells me to go into a grocery store or, or something, I'm not... This isn't verbatim, but but he said he he did use a pinwheel. He said if they if the government tells me to wear a pinwheel uh, and go into a grocery store, you know I'm going to do it. And it was like this, you know, in, in the context of like I mean we're just to listen to the government. Yeah, they said it, we do whatever it. Whatever they have to say, and this was in the context of. Uh, was it know, vaccines or is ma- it was well, mask? Right. It, it was it was most specifically mask. Um, I don't know where, where he, he might have meant mask and, and vaccine. I don't know. Of course, the government's going to tell you we never made anyone get a vaccine. They didn't make anyone get myocarditis? Yeah, right. We didn't make anyone <laughs> get a vaccine. You know, we just we're going to you just we're going to lose your livelihood and everything else. But we didn't make you. No, we didn't make you. You had a choice. Um, you can keep your job. But it's safe. It's can... so safe that 60 or 70 years from now, we're going to allow you know, to come out what was in that vaccine. Anyway, uh, but but I couldn't believe Todd Friel. A lot of people couldn't believe Todd Friel said that. Um, that might be one that he wants to take back. I don't know. But he was basing it the on— The Internet gives no take backs. Right. He was trying to base it on Scripture and, and you know, First Peter. So let's look at First Peter 2, right? Beginning in verse—or uh, well, the lighting in here— it's either the lighting or my eyes. And it's, it's the lighting. It's the lighting. So submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as to the one in authority or to governors as sent by him, for the punishment, notice again, for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. That sounds a whole lot like Romans 13. It certainly does. Right? Yeah. Um, you know, th- then, he, then he goes down and, and he does... Uh, talk about, you know, verse 17, honor all people. Now, this is important, right? Honor all people, because everyone's made in God's image, mm-hmm. right? We're, we're to honor all people. The From doesn't, conception to death. Right. That yeah. doesn't mean we obey everything they say. That's not what that means, right? Yeah. So we honor all people, love the brotherhood, right? Now, that's interesting, because that's even getting... It, 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 so notice what's happening here in this verse is that there's this expanse of it's all reaching and then it's going to narrow, 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 you know, and close itself in, mm-hmm. right? So honor all people, believers, unbelievers, all alike. Then it says love the brotherhood. In other words, love other 
Christians. Right. Right? Um, now, this doesn't take away from loving unbelievers or loving your enemies and so forth, right? But the point here is just we, we honor all people, but there's a special bond that we can only have by being in Christ. Right. And the love one another passages that we see all through the New Testament are directed to right. believers loving other believers. Right. So honor all people, love the brotherhood. And I like this, fear God. Because fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Exactly. Fear God, and then he says, honor the king. Now, that's something that most people, you know, are probably not going to want to do, right? So, honor the king, okay? Well, yeah, we, we should do that. But there's nothing in there talking about total submission. Mm-hmm. So then somebody might say, well, 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 how do you prove that that wouldn't be total submission? Okay, well, do we believe a woman should submit to her husband? Well, if we believe Scripture, we do, right? We would say yes, right. Now, is that submission total and complete, absolute, no caveats? Well, of course not. Mm -hmm. What what, what type of of pastor or Christian couple, if if a woman came to them and said, hey, you know, I'm having some problems with my marriage, you know, he, he, he beats me and... Well, just suck it up and take it. Yeah, I mean, that's ridiculous, right? Be submissive. Total submission. <laughs> that black eye will heal, right? We're not going to say that. Only, uh, only a moron would say that, right? right? That's right. In fact, we would be outraged if we heard that someone said that. Right. So clearly, uh, submission in Scripture, except for when, the, when people are called to submit to God, Right. Who is the supreme authority of right. the universe? Okay. Outside of that context, there, there, there are always the submission is never total. Yeah. Absolute. Right? The only absolute submission is to God, the King of Kings and the Lord of right. Lords. Period. Right. Well, and I think okay. So as we think about the word honor, you know, one of the verses we see is honor your father and mother. Right. Yeah. A child who's two years old. Yeah. Honoring their father and mother looks very different than a child that's 25 or 45 and taking care of their ailing parents, but they're yeah. always honoring their parents, right? And yeah, so there's that's right. it, there's not the obedience that a, a 7-year-old is required yeah. as a child honoring their parents yeah. is very different than the 45 or 55-year-old yeah. man who's tending to his ailing parents and honoring them, but yet it, you know, he's not required to have a curfew like the 16-year-old is required to come home at a certain time yeah. right, with his parents. Right, that's right. And, and, of course, honor, you know, we're talking about esteem, right, right. E- esteeming. Um, and, and so in that way, like even in our context, and this is where we do have to be careful, and this is where I said, you know, the grid kind of how not to engage. Yeah. Uh, where the big thing... For some, and this still happens, I guess, with some Christian leaders. But they will, and I've I've been guilty of this. I won't just say some Christian leaders, but uh, calling out leader, you know, presidents or whatever, and personal attacks from the pulpit. You know, changing their name. Orange man bad. Yeah, I mean, I remember. Yeah, you know, Jerry Falwell used to love to say Hillary instead of Hillary <laughs> and things like that. And 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 I get it, but that's not. <laughs> Right. honoring and so we have to be careful sure, with that sure. now you can call them out you can call their sin out uh, like there's nothing wrong with, with with doing that right that's what we're supposed to expose yeah. that so so you can do that uh, but the, the the attack shouldn't be personal there should be a, an esteem again an honor in that at the very least, in that they're made in the image of God. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, if there's if there's nothing else positive you can say about them, uh, you should be able to say that. But my whole point here is 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 here with with Peter, uh, and along with Romans, we, we we don't we're not called to absolute total submission. Mm-hmm. To okay. a human institution. Right. So so that's where Romans and, and Peter become important for us to understand. Because, again, they're just some that just say, oh, it's a carte blanche, see? 
we have to do whatever they're saying. Um, obviously, most people would say, with the caveat, as long as it's not something against Scripture. Right. You know? Um, or something that God has clearly, you know, said in Scripture right now. Having said all of that, uh, we then have to come and say, okay, our political, our cultural engagement, our political engagement, a lot of that is going to be dictated by the laws of the land, right? Yeah. And, and what we're allowed to do and so forth. So again, being in a republic... Uh, especially the one that we're in. Right. You know, we look at our Constitution. Uh, we have a lot more freedom than other people in the world today and certainly people throughout the last 2,000 years. So how would we—so what does that look like for us? Yeah, what, and what, I think maybe a good question for us to ask is, you know, with the the understanding that we live in a constitutional republic, Right. you know, if we were to time warp— Peter and Paul, yeah, the apostles, yeah, be, because, you know, yeah. the, there's only, the apostles don't continue. They are a fixed yeah. item. But if we were to take the apostles, time warp them to today in American American Christianity yeah. under the Constitutional Republic, <clears throat> what do you think? How, how would they respond? What would they say in these passages yeah. or in a yeah. situation? Yeah, that would be, uh, it'd be pretty pretty awesome to be able to do that, huh? Well, right, so that's where we have to ask, okay, what would what, what would Paul do? Now, the big question is, what would Jesus do, WWJD. right? WWJD. Right. We're saying WWPD. Right, because Jesus always, he's he's God, and he, he of course, he would be perfect, always do what was right. Um, and so it's a little easier for us to get an understanding by looking at a Paul or a Peter, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Jesus, everybody bows to him. He's, yes. he's the God man, right? Um, he's sovereign God. So let's ask, how would Paul, how would Peter? So Peter hung out with Jesus. Um, Paul sees the risen Lord, uh, right, as he gets saved on the road to Damascus. Uh, just quick glimpse. Mm-hmm. But so, so how would these men, if they were here in the United States, and let's just say they were American citizens, how would they see things? What would they do? Do we have any examples? Well, we do. We do. And I think it's a perfect example of Romans 13 and 1 Peter 4. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our listeners will remember that uh, in Paul's many missionary journeys, uh, and throughout Paul's life, he was constantly, you know, beaten. I mean, there were times where he was stoned, right? He was even shipwrecked. Um, I mean, he talked about a tremendous uh, experiences. Well, you might remember Paul was going to be whipped, mm-hmm. right? And what did he do? What did he do? That's right. Right now, our hammerheads are going back in their their minds right now. As we ask this question. Right. So here's Paul. Right. So he's a Roman citizen, right? He had Roman citizenship. Yes. Let me see what chapter that's so in. There, so there, yeah, well, you can look that up, and I'm going to explain the story. So here's Paul who is, is going to be, here you have an official, a Roman official. Okay, we're going we're gonna to whip you, and of course... You know, they weren't supposed to do more than 40, you know, or they're supposed to do 40, so they do count up to 39, just in case they missed one. Nice guys. So here Paul's going to gonna get beat, beaten. Now, some people would say, yes, Paul right here needs to just take it. That's right. Take the Take beatings. it. As a Christian, take your chest or take your, uh, you know, punishment from the government. Uh, take your persecution. That's the word I'm looking for. Okay? Don't okay, speak yeah. up. Don't speak up. Just take it. Well. That would be the honorable thing for him to do. Well, they would say that would be Romans 13. That would be First Peter. Yeah. Okay, no. Notice what he does. Yeah, here it is in Acts. Yeah, I'll just let you read it because yeah. it's. The lighting. It's not the, it's, 
It's the lights. Acts 22, uh, starting in verse, I'll read 24. Yeah, the give tribune, us a context. Yeah, from 23. And they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and fleeing dust into the air. Quite the scene. And the tribune ordered him, Paul, to be brought into the barracks, saying that that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. Verse 25. But when they stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. Verse 27. So the tribune came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, Yes. The tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, But I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. And the tribune also was afraid. For he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen that he and that he had been bound. Right. Okay. So that is a perfect example of Romans 13, yeah. 1 Peter. In other words, here's Paul. Now, if he was supposed to be total submission and if the governing authority were actually people, yes. then he should have just been quiet taken and just let the tribune take the flogging, right? Take the beating, Paul. But what does he do? He Paul did not appeal to a person. Mm-hmm. He said, I'm a Roman citizen. Now, so what? Well, in their written law, i.e. our Constitution, right? right, right. But for them, right, in their own written law, one of the things that was written is that you could not flog a Roman citizen. Yeah. Okay? So... I want you to see what Paul does there. He, again, appeals yeah. to perfect illustration. Yeah, I don't think you could – people are like, we don't know what would happen because, you know, the Bible, we have no illustration. Here we do. We do right that's here. a perfect illustration. Paul says, you, the tribune, you may be an official, and you may be acting in an official government capacity. Right. But I don't have to put myself under you in total submission. You need to submit. To the Just like authority. I do to the written law. Yeah. And I think it's interesting, too, to note that all that happens locally, right? Like we established at the beginning, all politics, all influence starts locally. Yeah. So they're in this local region. There's the centurions, the tribunes that are over that region that are about to flog him. And yeah. he appeals to the higher authority from that region. And then everything kind of works its way up, but it starts right here right. in your own backyard. Yeah, right. So, again, here's Paul saying, no, can't do that because of the written law. Yeah. Okay. Same way. Exactly. Again, I'll go back to what we talked about last time, but same way, okay, when you come together and worship, you you have to wear a mask. I'm going to mandate that. Okay. Again, forget about the efficacy or lack of efficacy of the mask. I think we all agree on that. There's enough studies out. That's obvious. Yeah, okay. the jury seems to be out on the... It, right. That. So anybody that knew anything about history leading up to this knew that they weren't, you know, going to work anyway. But that being beside the point, in our context with COVID, right, the governor saying you have to wear a mask. We, like Paul, right, appeal to what's in writing, which says they can't tell us how we're to conduct ourselves when we worship yeah. Okay. So it was in perfect keeping with what Paul did, and we see an example. So so I would suggest that that tells us that if Paul can't speak for Peter, uh, but if Paul were here as a United States citizen, when it called for it, he would appeal to the written law of the land. Right. He would have used the the Constitution that we have— to his advantage. Right. To advance the gospel. Right. And what's wrong with that? Did Paul wimp out? 
No. W- was he weak when he said, don't flog me? This is a guy who got beat everywhere he went all the yeah. time. Oh, left for dead right. several times. Uh, so this is a guy that never ran from a beating. Right. But he also didn't unnecessarily take a beating. Yeah, I think that's a great distinction that I think people in the discussion miss. Absolutely. Right? I don't it, think people think about no. it that much. Well, I certainly I, didn't think about all these things as a younger man. You yeah. know what I mean? You read scripture, you keep putting things together, and, and uh, so... Well, yeah, it's not like everybody's life versus Acts 22, verse 25, right? Right. It's one of those that you read and you don't think about until... God forces the situation like COVID. Right. And everyone's eyes, you have to look on it. You have to start thinking about this. Right. Yeah, and and that's why, as a result of that, that's why we have some people today, you know, professing believers who, again, you know, they go, nah, we have to totally submit. You know, and in one sense, it's easy to say that when you live in in a cushy period, you know, are, are they going to say that when people knock on their door and try to drag their kids out of their home? I would or, hope or, not. Or, the, or their grandkids? Yeah, I would hope not. Uh, but look yeah. at what they did in Nazi Germany. Well, right, Some that's where would I was hide going. The, yeah. Right. Oh, I got ahead of you. I see them stealing your thunder. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Stop looking at my notes and worry about your notes. Do you even have any notes I don't, over there? I don't need notes. I, I'm, I, if I had notes, I wouldn't be able to keep my half my brain tied behind my back. I think it's farther back. Well, anyway, so, yeah, so, exactly, right? A lot of people say, or at least some people, say, well, uh, Bonhoeffer was wrong. Mm -hmm. And they'll actually use Romans 13. You know, they'll use 1 Peter 2, and it's like, really? Boy, I tell you what, uh, I I hope when things go down, you're not my neighbor. Give me a Bonhoeffer. (laughs) You know, yeah. So now, yeah. What, what I always said when I was a younger believer, and people asked me the Bonhoeffer question, you know, was he right? Was he wrong? You know, I used to say, look, I don't. And at that time, I didn't know as much about the situation. And of course, we can read all we want, and and I've read a tremendous amount on it from different view, different viewpoints, and all that. But but reading about it's one thing. Mm-hmm. Being there in that situation is another, right? So what I used to say as a younger believer is, look, I, I don't know if he was biblically right, but I'm pretty sure I would have done, I hope, I would have done the same thing he did. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, g- give me a man with, with that kind of courage. And in fact, other people, which is interesting, uh, other believers from that time uh, that lived at the same time as Bonhoeffer and took the other route, uh, not all of them, but some of them came out after that and said he was right. We we were wrong. Yeah, it's interesting. We, we were weak. We were in sin, and they they were there in it. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to take their viewpoint. You know, when when they say, "Hey, he actually was right. He had it right." Yeah. And of course, with with, with Bonhart, we'll, we'll, we have to do a whole thing on him. Yeah, yeah, so we definitely there, but, need to do one on but him. But the point being. Um, Getting back to Paul, as I think it's just a perfect example of how we uh, thread the needle here. Yeah, Acts 22, verse 25 right. and following. And, and how we live, you know, how the governing authority, as I've said, is actually our constitution. Right. You know, now, things, things will get more difficult if we keep spiraling downhill um, for us here in this nation because eventually they'll just... I mean, they already disregard the Constitution when they want to, uh, some of the leaders, right? But but when they uh, just disregard it or when they rewrite it, you know, then we're going to have, you know, things are going to get a little tougher for us. Well, yeah, because then but, that, that comes into the question of, like, okay, how do, you, how do you mitigate when someone just disregards the Constitution, right? Right. Um... But yeah, that, that's probably for another episode because we're. Yeah. It's about time. It is time for the Inquisition. So before we get to the Inquisition, I think we need to be reminded of our sponsor today. Our sponsor so is. So, in other words, you forgot again and now have to throw this in at the end. Hey, it's we're going to lose our sponsorship. It's, it's not my fault. It's our producer, Snurdly. Come, yeah, we're Snirdly. not going to be able to afford the rent on this high priced studio we have in an undisclosed. Location. That's right. That's and by right. the way, I think we should let the people know that 
we have concluded our investigation. Oh, yes. Okay, good. Yeah. On and, the matter. Well, right. Uh, we indeed were hacked. We, we said that uh, it was by Arminians. We were right in that assumption. And then we mentioned that uh, the, the URL and I don't know all the technicalities. IP address. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Went, we had to chase it through several VPNs, that's right. actually. That's right. And it went to the Canner Brothers. Mm. And, uh, well... The Bible says we're to forgive other believers and not take them to court. So we're gonna we're gonna let it pass. And you know, I miss Ergen. I wonder what he's up to. You know, and my wife and I Ergen were talking about. Well, I, well, we we got to see uh, Oz Guinness. Yeah, yeah. When he came to town recently, and and so then just driving down the road, you know, my wife wife and I've been listening to some of his uh, lectures, and and we laugh because like his lectures are almost always the same with a few new things put in. But he always starts out letting us know where he was born and all that. And, and I remember saying to my wife, I said, you know, it, it's so it's so boring, you know, because we know where Oz was born and everything. You know, at least with Ergen, w- when he was preaching or lecturing, you never knew where he was going to be born this time. <laughs> you know, he always had a new birthplace. He always had a new story. Yeah, it was a, uh, a changing story. So it definitely story. was interesting. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Uh, so they have promised not to hack our uh, episodes anymore. Good. They just, they have to tune in. They've actually, once they hacked it, they realized the greatness of this podcast. And so now they're, they are hammerheads. They're trying to listen just to, that's right, to gain more insight. That's right. Into all the happenings around them. That's right. So, all right, good. Well, our sponsor, neglected by Snurdly, but I'll, we will forgive you, Snurdly, is Truth. You need it. That brings us to the Inquisitions. Let me turn here into the vault. And, oh, oh. All right, good, good. And I have here in my formerly Buffalo Wild Wing stained hands. That's right. That, that half-price wing day was too irresistible. Yeah. I got a barbecue one this time. It was pretty good. It was a little messy but delicious. Um, I have here well, my... Well, you eat it like a wood chipper. <laughs> You know, I figure if it's messy, if you eat it I'll quick, it's you, less messy. I'll give messy. you credit, though. I think I'm pretty sure you eat ligaments right with the, with the yeah, chicken. Yeah. You don't leave anything but the bone. And but, I'm not even sure you leave all the bones. But. That's right. You know, the bone has the good marrow in it, so that's, yeah, you know. so you get your money's worth. That's right. That's right. But I have here the Inquisition. Uh, strangely enough, it seems to be fitting to our context. This listener says, what would you say to those who voice something like, Ah, it doesn't matter which government is in power because the gospel spreads greatest among opposition. The gospel spreads greatest among opposition. Hmm. Well, okay. So certainly nothing will, Jesus said, nothing will stand in the way of him building his church, right? You know, the, the yeah. gates of Hades will not stand in the way. So... So we know he's going to build his kingdom and build his church, right? The kingdom program will progress. He will build his church. Um, however, and, and we look at the book of Acts, right? And this is where most people get this from, right? We look at the book of Acts and say, well, there's opposition, but the word still went out. The church grew. Uh, people got saved. That's true. Um, I should also say it's interesting to me that people who, you know, where we don't have a ton of opposition. Mm-hmm. It's easy to act like, yeah, opposition's a good thing. We it, would like it. It's almost know. a martyr complex, I feel yeah, like. Yeah, and the Bible never says, you know, desire it. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, you know, in fact, we pray for open doors for the ministry, right? Right. That the not, gospel could go not forth. F- not for, does anybody pray for opposition? I mean, if, if opposition is good for the spread of the gospel, then we should pray, Lord, give us persecution, give us opposition, Mm -hmm. martyr some of us. Mm -hmm. Next week when we come back for church, may some of us not be here because we've been martyred during the week, right? We don't don't pray like that. We don't think like that, right? Now, uh, so I would just ask this. Where has, has the gospel spread over the last, we'll just take 200 years, has the gospel spread greatest in our country, greater in our country or Russia over the last 200 years, just to give an example. Now, there are certainly, now a lot of people are sitting here saying, well, I don't know. 
because they know nothing about Russian Russia and missions, right? And certainly there are believers in Russia. Well, no, it's, it's spread here. Yeah. Uh, now, of course, and from here, right? From like as right as the locus so, of people being saved and going out. Yeah, there was some years ago, and I read this book. I was in, I was in college, so we're probably going back. You know, well, we are going back to to the nineties and uh, all the way back to the nineties. Whoa, whoa, whoa! And, there, the and 90s? I wish I could remember the name of the book or even the author, and I don't. Uh, he came to speak at convocation at Liberty, actually. Oh, so Stephen but, Furtick. Uh, no, this was back in in two thousand, <laughs> um, not last week. And and this guy wrote a book challenging that, where people say that the gospel always spreads fastest in places where there's most opposition or uh, in in uh, governments, you know, where uh, there's oppression, where, where there's socialism. And Censorship, right? And basically, of truth. What, what he what, what he what he tried to demonstrate in his book, and I didn't fact check the whole thing, uh, but I remember reading and, and I thought it was enlightening. And he was saying that that's actually not true. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, again, it doesn't mean it, nothing thwarts God's plan, right? Yeah, yeah. God God advances but, no matter what. Right. So again, it gets back to where I say, you know, when I vote, right? I'm I want. Since the gospel, I believe, is the only answer, I'm going to mm-hmm. vote for what I think is the most likely. You know, I'll take Cyrus over Satan any day, and I'll explain that in another podcast, right? Yeah, no, I think so that's... So yeah. I'm going to look... Uh, Jesus isn't on a, is never on a ballot, but I'm going to look and say, what party, what candidate do I think is going to be most conducive mm-hmm. to the proclamation of the gospel? Mm-hmm. That means the gospel being spread in our own nation. Yes. That also gets into what do I think it's going to look like economically? Because the more uh, the more money that people have and bring home, and the less taxes they're paying and all that, right? Yeah. Uh, it's just a proven fact that they then will give more. You, you know, look right. if you have somebody, you know, that's even tithing, right? Then ten percent of more, ten percent of a hundred is more than ten percent of fifty, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so what does that do to the mission endeavor? So, so I look at all of that. Well, and then I think the inflation element too, because okay, sure. Just take the illustration you made: ten percent of a hundred is right. more than ten percent of fifty. But then, if inflation makes the fifty dollars that I do get yeah. go less, right? Right. Instead of buying a one plane ticket or two plane tickets for fifty. I can only buy one. It means less, less money can be spent. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And so again, now are we gonna, you know, uh, go crazy and act as people that have no hope if things don't go our way? No. But as believers, to just be apathetic and say, "Well, it doesn't matter. God triumphs no matter what." Well, well, yes, He does. But we still like Paul. Yeah. Sovereign right? over the ends we, we still, and the means. Right. Right, we we still want things to be uh, as as best they can, mm-hmm. um, and we ought to work. Our responsibility, I think, is to work toward that end, uh, and not just simply be apathetic. Right, and again, I use the same illustration with parenting. God has to save my child; he, that my child will be saved by God's grace, just period. like I was saved. Yeah. Okay. Period. Well, I don't just okay. I've got children. Great. You know, I'll feed them. You know, I'll change diapers when I have to, blah, blah, blah. But I'm not going to really tell them about the Lord. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. We don't do that, right? No. no. Yeah. Because the means of God bringing them to himself is our influence is as parents. Be, exactly. Right? Yeah. So we just need to kind of apply that there. And, so. if, and if the family unit, which per God right. from Genesis is the building block of all society, right? If we're going to do that in our right. families— that should we should logically flow that that would do in the next step with right. the people around us, the community around us, and then as it goes up. Right, exactly. So, all right, well, good. That <clears throat> brings us to yet another close. Hammerheads, you hold on. We will be back in 168 hours. hours.